All right, it's about that time we're going to get started. Welcome to Sunday School on this pretty July 4th morning. We celebrate Independence Weekend. <clears throat> Thank you for being here. We know a lot of people are on vacation, but we spent in some fireworks here saving grace this morning. All right, so we'll um, go to, together in prayer. Does anyone have a special prayer request this morning? Let's remember Jim Troop. Remember Patsy, Aunt Patsy and Aunt Sweden. Cliff went and saw them yesterday. Uh, remember Junior Benefield, his last sister died yesterday, so Cliff had to go tell him that. So remember Junior. Let's remember these. Anybody else? Who now? Okay, let's remember these. Let's remember <laughs> how that is. Remember our babies in the community. You just don't know what they live through sometimes. So let's remember these kids. It breaks my heart <clears throat> going into some of these places. Anybody else got a prayer request? Let's remember J James Steele. We get on the men. Anybody else this morning? Amen. Let's remember these. All right, let's join together in prayer this morning. Our precious Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we thank you for all of these requests that have been brought to your attention, God, Lord. Even though we know you already know about them, God, and you're already working in the midst, God, Lord. We ask for special favor in each of these, God, Lord. That they'll have the healing that they need, everything that they need, Lord, that you'll come to their rescue, God, as always, Lord. Lord, we thank you for this Independence Day, for the freedom that you have given us and our country, Lord, for the chains that you've unbound in our lives, God. Lord, we thank you for that, God, Lord. Lord, we pray for our service today from Sunday school to our regular service, God. We invite your presence here, your anointing, God, because without that, we have nothing, God. We just thank you, and we're looking forward, and thank you in advance for the service that we're going to have today. We're expecting fireworks in Jesus' name. Amen. Our lesson today is um, still continuing about the early church, but it's increasing ministry and, of course, when Stephen was martyred, he was the first martyr for, for the Christian faith. It says, the word of God increased and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. So as our lesson begins, it begins to talk about how the early church was growing tremendously. And when you have a sudden growth like that, it can cause a lot of problems. And so we're going to look at some of the problems that they were having and how they had to learn to deal with those problems. Um, you know, this was totally against what the Sanhedrins and the early people who were against Jesus were trying to do. They were trying to quiet everything down. They thought they had gotten rid of Jesus. They had crucified him. But see, they didn't realize that they had just gotten everybody stirred up. They were attracting attention. The church was growing. They thought that, like I said, they had gotten rid of the problem, but instead now just a few scattering of followers, there were thousands and thousands coming into the ministry. And so those efforts to stop the church, they couldn't do it. We know we can't stop God's plan. And so they were getting really aggravated, and this Stephen got involved with, with that too, and he actually got sort of the, <clears throat> what do you call it, the not the benefit of the rage, but he actually, they took it, took it out on him. So we know that when there's sudden growth, that a lot of times a lot of problem occurs with that. We can remember when we started saving grace and we began to grow suddenly, there were a lot of problems that come uh, out about that. Oh, we didn't have a lot of Sunday school teachers. We didn't have a lot of musicians when we first started, you know, but God kept sending people and we relied on the Holy Spirit to provide those. And he did. A lot of times it was talking about how the early church was growing so fast that they didn't even have the infrastructure to hold all the people. Do y'all remember when we were first um, in our first church and we, I don't know how many people were in the very first double wide, but <clears throat> we didn't even have bathrooms when we started. So we put bathrooms in the back of them and our kitchen was probably about the size of a closet back there. And when you go in there and tried to make sandwiches, you're all kind of like scooting around. But, you know, we were so thankful and we were happy. And then God blessed us with the six piece and we were even more excited. And, you know, I, I never forget those early days and what we went through and how God provided us maybe not at the rate that I wanted because I would sit there and I'm like man I wish we had Sunday school classrooms for our babies Do you remember we started we didn't even have Sunday school classrooms there was an old single white on the farm 
And uh, we went in there, and we tried to make that just as nice as we could. And we took chalk paint, and we painted it up, and we painted the cabinets. And our kids had Sunday school in there until the electrical blew and the hole fell in the floor so we had to go do something else but God always provided there were there was things I remember having vacation Bible school and we had vacation Bible school we had a class in the foyer and then we we had the old double wide that we used uh, for the social hall then and we would divide up and you would try to have three classes in there and everybody was talking at the same time but you know we had problems but we came together and we did the best that we could and we always relied on the Holy Spirit and this is what the early church were they were facing they were growing it so fast that it was causing so many problems and so one of the things they brought up in our Sunday school lesson is sometimes the problems arise such as you ever been out and about and you had a flat tire and you had no idea how to change a flat tire until you call somebody maybe they walked you through it and you had to get out there and learn how to change a tire by necessity because you're on the side of the road and you need your tire changed well that was the example that they gave about the early church these problems they had never experienced before but out of necessity they were having to learn how to deal with them with them and so through that through these problems problems that were coming in they were learning to have an effective ministry and they tackled the problems as they came but first and foremost they always relied on the Holy Spirit but what began to happen they realized that those 12 apostles needed help those 12 apostles couldn't carry this ministry that was growing so fast they needed people to come in there and be a part of that ministry and that's what they did and it wasn't just the apostles now who had the power and the spirit all these people who were effective leaders in the ministry they were too had the same power and the same spirit that those apostles had and one of the big things is we always talk about that even the, the people, as they, if they had all these problems and it was tough at times, you know, we know that serving God comes with a cost, but it is a cost that is well worth it. You will never, never regret your decision uh, to proclaim the gospel. That's what we were put on this earth to do. In Acts 6, 1 through 6, here comes the first problem, or one of the first problems that they were dealing with in the early church. It says, and in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows was neglected in the daily ministration. They were so worried about proclaiming the gospel and getting the gospel out that there were needs in the church that was getting neglected. And the, one of the needs was that, that the widows who they were supposed to be taken care of were not getting taken care of. And so it was making people upset. Upset. So the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. The apostles were saying, We have been called to preach the word. We've got to go out and preach the word. That's what we have got to do. He said, we need some people to come in here and help with other aspects of ministry. So in verse 3, it says, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But will we give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word? And the saying pleased the whole multitude. All right, they wanted to choose seven men filled with the Holy Spirit that could go out and take care of the needs in the church while they could continue preaching the gospel. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and I don't know how to pronounce these, Procris, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. They chose seven men who were filled with the Holy Spirit. And the first thing they did is they brought them before the people, and they laid hands on them, and they prayed for them. Now, what you're going to see with this ministry is they chose these seven people. Their only job was not to just feed the widows and take care of that. They had to be filled with the Holy Spirit and power to be effective ministry, and to be effective leaders in the ministry. But they were called in to help. They had a very substantial uh, work inside the church, even though they weren't necessarily called to preach as the apostles were about preaching the gospel. So the Holy Spirit was providing them with direction. Notice they prayed about it. They prayed who that they should be. Some people recognize these as the first sort of callings of the deacons of the church and their responsibility in the church. See, <clears throat> the apostles knew that they could not take their focus off of preaching the word. I hear Cliff talk about all the time, I think that's one of the most frustrating things, is not that people call him all the time, but sometimes he just has to turn the phone off. He leaves it in here on the desk. He says, Sister Brandy, I'm taking a few hours to go study in the word of prayer. Please keep my phone and 
I'll get it in just a minute. Just so he's, 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 he's feeding himself so he can feed you. And that's what they were wanting to do. So it says that even though the only seven apostles were chosen to be effective ministry, we all have a part we know in the body of Christ. You have a part as an effective a part of our ministry here at Saving Grace. And finding that part is what's important for you so we can all work together. Uh, God didn't put just a few people to be part of ministry. We're all part of this ministry together. And one of the questions was, why is it important for pastors to spend time in prayer and the ministry of the word? We know that. They have to feed themselves. Sometimes Cliff will come down here every day, and he'll usually study in the morning, and uh, I ask him about his message. He's like, I wasn't looking for a message. I was just feeding me. I was just reading my word for myself. And he likes to do that every day. He likes to read for himself, not to prepare a message for us, but just for him to get into God's word and to know it and to have that relationship with Christ. One of the questions they ask is, how, is your, how have you grown in your faith through serving? Man, that's how we grow in our faith. It's an honor to serve for Christ. It's an honor. I know I've said it before. Sometimes when you get so exhausted, you just thank the Lord. Like, Lord, I'm glad I'm tired working for you. I could be tired working for the world, but I'm tired working for you. Serving others. Uh, you know, I, I'm not very comfortable being in, in front of here. I'm not very comfortable with a mic in my hand. This is not probably, I would much rather be on the front seat listening to somebody else talk. It's just easier to do that. Um, even though I like to joke and cut up, I'm really kind of shy. Um, I'm telling you, I, I've told you about, <laughs> I passed out my first speech in college. I just can't stand being in front of people. So it's not, it's not comfortable. I like to be in the background, but I like to do for people. I like to do things for people that, you know, you don't know about. Kind things like serve others. When you serve others, it just builds, I don't know, maybe it's the love of Jesus that's growing in you when you serve others and you do things for others. It, it makes your faith in Jesus Christ better because that's what he was about. He was all about love. That's all <clears throat> one of his main things is to show love to others. So we can see... Um, in Acts 6 through 7, it talks about sustained growth. How do we sustain that growth? You know, you can have a, a big explosion, but if you don't know how to deal with that well with growth, then there comes the problems. You have to deal with those as well. It says, And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. People were getting saved left and right. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Even some of the Jewish priests got saved. And when we face problems um, in the church or as individuals, listen to what may happen. We may be tempted to lose or be distracted by these problems that come in here. Sometimes we get our mind on our problems instead of what our main mission was. And one of the main ideas of this lesson is even though this early church was facing problems that could have distracted them, they never took their eye off the prize. They never took their eye off their mission that they were supposed to do, be, and that was proclaiming the gospel to the lost. And so we see that they had this problem that came up that could have easily distracted them, and they could have caused a big rumble. They fixed it, they prayed about it, and they went on to what they were supposed to be doing, which was working for Christ. They dealt with it, they moved on, they continued to work to do the work of Jesus what he had called them to do. So we are cautioned this morning to not let the challenges that come up while we're in the ministry distract us from what we're here for. We can't let things distract us. I know when we were building the church, I mean, I was really so proud of the church. That we didn't argue about wall colors or stuff. It was like this, hey, we tried to emphasize, let's don't worry about this stuff. This is menial stuff. What are we here for? We're not worried about the color of the walls or the color of the carpet. We're worried about some lost soul that's out there that we're building a place that they could come and worship Christ, that they could come and be introduced to him like we were introduced to him. That is our mission to proclaim the gospel. We have to be, be careful that things and problems that arise in the church don't distract us from that. Because if we can, as a ministry, get single-minded on what we're here to do, we're here to tell somebody about Jesus Christ, to proclaim the gospel. Those little things in the church, they do not matter. And we know that all coming together, we have different personalities and different. we like different things. We like things done differently. But those things don't matter. 
what matters is that we're obeying the Holy Spirit in our life, that we're following his direction, and that we are proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we worried more about the lost soul than we did about anything about how the church is run, or who's teaching what, or who's preaching what, or who's singing what, that stuff does not matter. It's about listening to the Holy Ghost, and it is about a lost soul out there that we need to be worried about. I can I will tell you, if we worried about that lost soul more than we did our own needs, our own wants, God will pour out his blessings and you will see a growth like you have never experienced. And I believe that we're on the verge of that growth of the world realizing that that the end is coming, that we we are running out of time, that the harvest is ready, and that's what we're supposed to be out there doing is gathering that harvest. The people of the early church, that's what they were doing. They were proclaiming the message of Jesus Christ, and that remained their priority regardless of what came up against them. And what was the result of that? What was the result of the gospel being their top priority? The result was multiplication. They, I'm sorry, that was kind of a corny math joke too in there if you didn't get that. But anyway, <laughs> sorry math teacher. But anyway, multiplication. There was an increase in those that served Jesus Christ. The church continued to grow. And that's what we want to see. Not that our numbers in saving grace grow. We're not really concerned about that. But does the numbers to the kingdom has that increased? Because we could fill up these pews and not have increased the kingdom. But I want some righteous, holy, living people filling in these seats who have have a relationship with Jesus Christ, who know him. That's when we have added to the kingdom. We see that the early church, just like today, they had prosecution from outside the church, and they had problems within the church, but that didn't keep them from serving the Lord, and it didn't keep the Lord from building his church. It does not matter what prosecution comes our way. It doesn't matter what problems that are in this church or in any church. God is going to build his church. He's going to find a way, and I want to be submissive to his will that I don't become a problem for him, but I want to be a helpmate. Uh, I want him to use me to be able to build his church. And uh, today we're going to talk about one of those seven people who were chosen by the early church to care for the widows, and that was Stephen. Now, Stephen, even though he was chosen to care for the widows, he was full of the Holy Ghost. And, and it says, if you read in the scripture, that he, in the verse 8 of Ch Acts chapter 6, says, And Stephen, full of faith, faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Now listen to this. This was the man who was chosen to feed the widows. He was chosen to work in the church. But that wasn't his only part of ministry, was just taking care of things in the church. He was full of faith. He was full of power. He was full of the Holy Ghost. And he, God used him to even perform miracles in people's life. It says in verse 9, There arose certain of the synagogue, here comes the problems, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. So here come these people, and they're arguing with Stephen. What they first start off maybe just discussing about the Messiah and all that. It turns into an argument. Verse 10 says, And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Everything they threw at Stephen, they couldn't come back with him. He had so much wisdom through the Holy Spirit that they couldn't, they couldn't get him. They couldn't win the debate. It says that even though the seven were involved in the daily operations, they were filled with the Spirit, they were spirit filled with wisdom, and they were out about doing miracles. And they saw Stephen doing these miracles, and they knew that, that he was helping people come into this 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 movement that they were trying to they thought they had squandered when they crucified Jesus but here Stephen was a part of that they probably didn't like the fact that here they were discussing this and they just could not win Stephen always had the right thing to say the Holy Ghost will always give you the right thing to say it says Stephen was called to serve the needy but he was powerfully used by the Lord to proclaim the gospel God was using him in other ways besides feeding those widows and says Stephen's arguments were fueled by the power and wisdom of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was feeding them. He had a relationship. Just like Stephen, you don't have to be a pastor, a teacher, or apostle to minister. You're supposed to be ministers on a daily basis. You're supposed to be proclaiming the gospel on a daily basis. You don't have to have a pulpit to preach from to be a preacher. 
because the way you live your life should be preaching it most of all and loudest of all. People should be able to look at you and say, man, that person's got something that I want. I don't know what they got, but I got to have some of it. That's when you're living it, you're preaching it louder than any preacher could from a pulpit. And when you have a heart to serve and yielded to the Lord like the early church did and like Stephen did, great things can happen. One of the things that our Sunday school lesson says, we need a generation of Stephens. If you look at Stephen and how he was not only willing to work, but had a love for Christ, he had the Holy Spirit within him and he was performing miracles throughout. But the way that he accepted uh, his death that was coming, um, we could draw on that. And I, I thought about that all week, about how he was so willing to die for his Savior. And it was an honor for him to do that. Um, in Acts 6, 11 through 15, this is what happened. It said, then they, suborned, then they suborned men which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. They took the very words that Stephen had told them and they twisted them and they corrupted them and they turned the people against him. They got everybody stirred up. He's blasphemed against Moses and he's blasphemed against God. And they brought him before the high council or the Sanhedrin's. And they set up false witnesses which said, they had people say, the man ceases not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. They had people telling them, false witnesses, lying on them. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And they sat in the council looking steadfastly on him. Listen to this. And saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Now, here Stephen was being lied on. He's before the Sanhedrin. He's before the high council. He's been said that he's blasphemed against Moses and of God. And they see that his face looks like an angel. Maybe that was God just giving them a, <coughs> a clear indication. They really knew that this was a man of God. That God had his hands on him regardless of that opposition that was coming against him. And it is true that when people don't like your message, oftentimes they attack the messenger. Why do you think that they attack the churches so much? It's not that they are really attacking the church. They don't like that message. They don't like the fact that we're saying that you can't do the things that the Bible says you can't do. That you can't live in sin and go to heaven too. That you have got to obey Christ. They don't like the fact that we're telling them you can't live the way that you live. And expect to live eternally with my Christ. Because he is holy and he is righteous. So therefore they attack the churches. They attack the messengers. They attack, they attack the pastors. But that's okay. If we look at Stephen's example, they can attack us all they want. But God's got his hands on us regardless as long as we're with him. It said um, they got everybody stirred up. This is what they were claiming, though. They claimed that Stephen said that Jesus was going to change the way they worshiped and the way, their whole way of life, and they got them all stirred up. But despite it all, here was Stephen, a true man of God. He remained calm, his face like an angel. And it says that we should be thankful that regardless of any opposition, any situation that we come in, that Holy Spirit is working on our behalf. And he gave Stephen the boldness and the power to stay on the mission. Man, can you imagine this, Stephen? His, his life is in danger. They're coming against him. But he's still there calm and bold and power to stay on the mission. He remained that top priority was proclaiming the gospel even until the end. We can learn a lot from, from Stephen today. Man, what if we had a generation of Stevens who would be willing to stay the mission no matter what obstacle, no matter what comes against you? <coughs> so here's what happened in Acts 7, 1 through 2. Then said the high priest, are these things so? And he said, men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. The glory of God appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Sharan. <coughs> Excuse me. Stephen had a very strong message for his, his listeners. He began to tell them about their history. Y'all started out as God people. Are you not the seed of Abraham? What have you always done? You have been a rebellious people. He told them the clear message of Jesus Christ. that He was the anticipated Messiah. Yet you were the very ones who crucified him. He said in verse 51, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. Your heart won't change. 
You don't listen. You always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, just like your ancestors. Did you not learn? So do ye. You're doing the same thing that your rebellious ancestors have done. Which of the prophets have your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which shewed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels, but have not kept it. He defended his teaching. He defended his, uh, the accused, his listeners, of rejecting God's work on their behalf. Just like their ancestors, just like them. You're still being the rebellious people, but you won't stop. You won't listen. You won't change your heart. You disobey the very law that you claim to uphold. Hypocritical. But if you read that, Stephen, he wasn't speaking out of anger at them. He was probably brokenhearted for his people. This is my people, you rebellious people. Why can't you just see? Why can't you just, why are you so blind to the truth that Jesus Christ died for you and that he was resurrected? Why are you still so blind? You know, sometimes we can get that in the ministry that it's not out of anger, but it's out of brokenness that you, you don't want them to die and go to hell. And that's what Stephen was telling them. And in this, we need to learn that when we defend our gospel, we should not defend it in anger. We should defend it with respect and with gentleness. If you go against someone who's coming against you in anger, that's not the way God intends it to be. We share good news that brings life to others. We shouldn't be beating people over the head with the gospel. We should be loving them with it so that they see it in us, that they see the kindness and the love in us. Let how we live, I love this, let we, how we live as followers of Jesus be the strongest point in our defense of the gospel. Man, you could preach that all day long. Let the life I live be my defense for the gospel. If your life is not a defense for the gospel, something's not lined up. And you cannot be an effective minister for the gospel if your life doesn't add up. To that gospel. But when your life and your walk adds up to the walk of Jesus Christ, that's the best defense for any gospel. Because you can argue till the cows come home. But if your life isn't lined up, you're going to do more harm than you will good. Don't argue. It says in Colossians 4, 6, May our words be with grace, seasoned with salt, that we may win hearts not arguments. Our goal here is not to win an argument about who does right, who's right, more right than the other. We don't care about winning the argument. We want to win hearts. And Colossians 4, 6 says, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man and let your life answer for them. We see that here comes Stephen's death in Acts 7, 54 through 60. Man, he got them riled up, stirred up. In verse 54, they said, When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. They're biting him. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, didn't matter, looked up steadfastly to heaven. And as they're, they're attacking him and they're gnashing on teeth, he saw the glory of the God and, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. In the midst of your worst trial, you can look up, and there you're going to see your father. And said, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. So he told them the vision that he was having. And they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears. They're not listening to him. And ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, received my spirit. Here Stephen was. He's telling them about what he's seeing. That just made them even madder. So they take him out, they drag him, and they stone him. And before his death, he cries out unto God, Lord, receive my spirit. And he knelt down with a loud voice and cried, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. He died in the example of Jesus Christ. He died knowing that he was fixing to be home with, with his heavenly father. But also he cried, Lord, forgive them for their sins, for they know not what they do, just like the example that Jesus set. Why? Why would God spare, not spare Stephen's life? We have, we have seen the proof in the pudding. We have seen that he is a man of God. We have seen that he's full of the Holy Spirit. We've seen miracles. Why wouldn't our God save him? Why would God kill him? Why would he let him do that? 
back to verse 58. And cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. That Saul became Paul on the road to Damascus. See, God's life for, God's plan for Stephen was far greater than, than maybe we could have even see at that, at that point. His death made such an impression on a man named Saul, who later became Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament. See, God's plan is always for the greater good of the kingdom. We may not see it. We may not understand why things happen in our life or, or why we perceive bad things to have happened. But see, God has a plan, a greater plan for the good. You know, that made such an impression on Paul that maybe that had some impact that he knew on the road of Damascus when God blinded him that this was the same God that Stephen had cried out to upon his death. That's why we trust him. We trust God in life and in death. Even though that the Sanhedrin, they had calculated and they were cunning in Jesus' death and Stephen's was made out of a, a, an impromptu, spontaneous rage, even in death, we see that Stephen followed that example of Jesus Christ. It says, what gives Christians the courage to lay down their own life for the sake of Christ? We have been blessed that most of us have not been asked to lay down our own life yet for Jesus Christ. But what gives somebody that kind of courage and boldness? It's that power of that Holy Spirit that resides within you. And the fact that you know without a shadow of a doubt that no matter what comes, if we do have to lay our life down for Jesus Christ, then when we open our eyes, then we'll be in our eternal home with him forever. And I love the last thing I'm going to tell you this morning. It says, and those that die for Christ, even us, have a hope that the souls that they witness to one day may become Paul's who declare in Philippians 1 and 21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. It doesn't matter if I live here living for Christ or if I die today. I'm going to gain either way because I've got a Christ within me and on my side. We're going to live either way. What is the hope that the person you witness to today, that Saul, becomes a Paul that changes the world? God's got a plan for our life, and he's going to see that plan fulfilled for the greater good. We're going to trust him each and every day. Thank y'all. I love y'all.